This man is engaged in an act of worship. He believes that his God dwells within the flames. This group of worshippers find their spiritual fulfillment through the medium of stone. They believe that divinity exists within the stone idol. Both the fire and the stone worshippers are examples of the numerous sects that exist within the Hindu religion. They all believe in a simple but absolute divine energy called Brahma. This can manifest itself in a substance or in a being. The Hindu religion is the world's third largest with more than 837 million followers. Older than Christianity, older than Islam, it is indisputably the world's earliest organized religion. Known to its followers as the Eternal Faith, or Snatan Dhurma, it is essentially a henotheistic religion, which is one that recognizes a single god, but also recognizes other gods and goddesses as manifestations of the Supreme God. In practice, however, it has evolved over many millennia to the worship of a trinity of Supreme Gods. Brahma, the creator of the universe, Shiva, the destroyer, and Vishnu, the preserver. In much Hindu worship, it is Vishnu who is thought to be eternal and keeps the balance between good and evil. Whenever that balance is upset, he incarnates on earth to restore harmony. It is believed that there will be ten such incarnations. So far, there have been nine. The tenth is yet to come. It is the eighth incarnation, however, who has been elevated to the highest place in the Hindu pantheon of gods. His name is Krishna. The similarities between the lives of Jesus and that of Krishna have led some academics to speculate that the Gospel's description of the life of Jesus are, in fact, based on the much earlier story of Krishna. Yet another theory is that Krishna could be the father referred to by Jesus in the Gospels. Naturally, many Christians regard this as close to blasphemous. However, there are others who see no such conflict between the two views. Pankaj Angri Dasa is one of identical twins who originally came from London but now lives in India. They still retain many of their basic Christian beliefs, but are now devout Hare Krishna monks. Sometimes people ask, ask us, how come you come to India? You left your culture, you left your faith, you come from a Christian background, how come you come in and worship in Krishna? I said, no, we haven't changed our religion. We haven't changed our faith specifically. We're still worshiping God. Lord Jesus Christ says, the first command actually is you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And he says that you come to the Father through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So who is Jesus is talking to his disciples at that time? In other words, Jesus is Guru for his disciples. In other words, you can only go to God to meet Guru. And Jesus is acting as Guru because he's saying that uh, I am the Son of God. So. Prakriti, everyone is a son of God. Jesus was a very pure son, and he was, we consider him a Shaktavesh avatar. We adore Lord Jesus Christ. He was, he was, his mission was to preach love of God. <laughs> but also he told his, his uh, followers and others, he said, there are many things to know, but you're not really able to hear them yet. Bhakti Raghuaswami originally trained to be a Roman Catholic priest, 
but as his belief in God evolved, he decided that Christianity could no longer fulfill his spiritual needs. It was then that he became a devotee of Krishna through the inspirational teachings of Srila Prabhupada. We talked to him at the Krishna Temple of West Virginia. In Christianity we have what is described as the uh, mystery of the Trinity, isn't it? Father, Son and Holy Ghost which I could not really understand very much when I was younger. When I came to Krishna Consciousness, we can all clearly understand this mysterious trinity of the Son, the Father, Son and Holy Ghost. So the Son of God is actually personalities like George, uh, Lord Jesus. All of us actually are sons of God. He is exemplary in that he became you know, the ideal Son of God. And then the Father, Krishna says, Oh, he is the original father, Aham Sarvasya Prabhavo, oh, the source of everything material and spiritual. So Krishna, he is the father actually of Jesus. He is the father of all living entities. And the Holy Ghost is actually Paramatma, Super Soul, oh, who is present in the material world, in the hearts of all living entities, and actually in every single atom. So in this way, you know, the all pervasiveness of God is that aspect or feature of what we call Paramatma or Super Soul. Such is his devotion to Krishna that he lost a leg fighting robbers who were trying to steal idols of Krishna from a temple in Mayapur. It is probably the heroic feats of Krishna coupled with the many miracles he was reputed to have performed that make Krishna the most popular of all Hindu gods. Among the most celebrated of his miracles are the parting of the rivers at his birth that allowed his father to flee with him to safety from their persecutors, and his miraculous intervention to save the honor of Draupadi, the wife of the Pandava kings. Perhaps the greatest feat of all was the annihilation of the vastly superior Kaurava army by the small Pandava army. The result of this, according to the legend, was to save the world from the forces of evil. This and many other of Krishna's heroic exploits are chronicled in the epic poem, the Mahabharat. Krishna undoubtedly is the most popular of the Hindu gods and the one closest to the heart of the people. His appeal to ordinary men and women everywhere is perhaps best summed up by Kamala Kumari Maishak, a classical Indian dancer who comes from Florida. Just recently, it has occurred to me how powerful that our relationship with Krishna is. Because regardless of what we go through, regardless of how many times we forget him, how many times we stray from our path, he's always there with open arms ready to let us back and that's why I feel my relationship with Krishna is like the deepest friendship and it's not in any way material like in some ways a friend might leave us for another friend or forget about us or forget to call us or something but I feel that Krishna is always there no matter no matter what you've been through he's always there just calling out come back and he has open arms just Ready, ready to accept us and all we have to do is turn to him and it's such a simple thing to just be able to tell him Krishna I'm here in appearance it was said he was dark and extremely handsome his name literally means the black one and black has underlying connotations with mysteriousness in Sanskrit he remains to this day shrouded in mystery an enigma perhaps a human being perhaps a God incarnate. Whatever the truth, it is an undoubted fact that he has abided in the hearts of millions for over three millennia. The noted writer Swami Hershananda said of Krishna, if a person can affect such a profound impact on the Hindu race, affecting its psyche, its ethos, and all aspects of its life for centuries, then he is no less than God. That is a view that is held by many devotees and converts worldwide. Nathaniel Clark, now known as Sikhi Mahiti Dasa, 
A disciple of Srila Prabhupada, the founder of the Hare Krishna movement, had this to say. I uh, was born in America in 1955, African American, so not your typical person whom you would think would believe Krishna's God coming from the uh, American community. Not just American community, but coming from the sometimes referred to as African American community or Negro community. But my background, of course, is uh, my parents were Christians. And uh, of course they followed the Bible, and the Bible has good information, but there wasn't enough information for me. I can remember going to church and asking quite often, uh, why was I born in this family? Why wasn't I born in a, a more opulent family? For instance, why wasn't I born in Bill Gates' family? Of course I didn't ask that at the time, he didn't exist. Or why wasn't I made more handsome? Or I would ask even, what does God look like? And of course, Christian priests would say, uh, nobody knows, you're not supposed to ask those questions. God is spirit, he's beyond your knowing, you just have to accept these simple things. But it wasn't enough for me. But still, I was so curious, my brother and I would always ask, but we couldn't find, we looked at Quran, we looked at Bible, and we would just speculate and really, really wanted to know. So finally, he graduated from high school, went to college, and when he was coming back one day, Somehow or another, he came in contact with the devotees from Harinab, and he brought back a Back to God Hit magazine. He told me, he says, you won't believe it. Read this. So immediately, I said, even though I told him, go get more books, find more books. So he bought a Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita that was sold in a bookstore at that time. And even though I couldn't read, you know, Krishna, Arjuna, because I didn't know Sanskrit and all those little kind of words, but I could jump through it enough that I could understand what was being said. And after a year of reading, I didn't live near a temple, but after a year of reading, I finally graduated from high school, it was in my first year of college, I finally decided that I wanted just to devote my life to serving Krishna. Amongst many former Christians, there exists a common belief that while Jesus Christ was the sublime prophet, it was Krishna who was the spiritual father. Krishna, then, is a religious icon, venerated by generations of Hindus. Yet there are many especially among the educated classes who doubt his very existence and regard the whole thing as somewhat of an ancient myth. There is now, however, compelling evidence to suggest that Krishna was no figment of the imagination, but a being who actually existed here on earth. His miracle performing may be disputed, his divinity even, but not, it seems, his existence. Krishna was born at least 14 centuries before Christ. Estimates of his actual birth vary from 14 centuries to 57 centuries BC. The Bhagavad Gita declares that Krishna is not just any god, but the Lord God, who descended on earth to protect the saints, annihilate the wicked, and to establish righteousness. Whenever the forces of evil rule the earth, I will incarnate myself to destroy the wicked, to protect the saints, and to establish righteousness in age after age. These are the words of Krishna as set down in the Bhagavad Gita. One of the best sources of evidence of Krishna is the Mahabharat, which dates from just before the Christian era. The critical edition of the Mahabharat lies at the Bandaka Oriental Research Institute at Pune in India. The Mahabharat consists of 18 books called Parwas, containing 100,000 verses. They describe a terrible war between the Pandavas, led by Krishna, and the evil Kauravas, in which four million soldiers are said to have perished in 18 days. The 100,000 Sanskrit verses of the Mahabharat were painstakingly transcribed from the Shadar Codex by Dr. Suktanka and his team of scholars. But could such a war have taken place so long ago? And did Krishna really exist? Some of the key sites referred to in the Mahabharat are Hastinapur, the capital, Kurukshetra, where the war was fought, and Indraprastha, or Delhi, as it is now called. Dr. Lal is probably India's best-known archaeologist who excavated Hastinapur over 60 years ago. Two extremely divergent views 
about the historicity of the Mahabharat. According to one view, everything mentioned in the text is true to the very letter. Another view holds that it is the figment of the imagination of a poet called Vyas or many poets. Actually, all this confusion is because the text is not contemporary with the event. That an advanced civilization did exist, at least as long ago as 1500 BC, is borne out by the discovery of various artifacts and a planned town by Dr. Lal and his team. Various artifacts, including earthenware, spearheads and dice for gambling, were found at Hastinapur. Evidence of a great flood that destroyed Hastinapur was also found, which caused the capital to be shifted to Kausambi, as narrated in the epic. So, there are two very divergent views about the Mahabharat. One, that it is historically and factually accurate. The other, that it is pure fiction. Rajesh Purohit is one of the foremost authorities on the subject. To understand the, uh, the, the, the authenticity of what has been narrated in the Mahabharata, we made an exploration of the data that we have pertaining to the river Saraswati, which is again a controversial uh, river because most of the scholars they believe that it was a mythical river. Interestingly, the data that we have today, it tells that it was a mighty river, virtually existed and produced a mighty civilization. We are coming across with both on the banks of river Saraswati on the north as well as on the south, the southern river, the Drishadvati river. Antiquities almost pertaining to the time of Indus Valley civilization as well as pre-Indus Valley civilization. If you take the river's journey from the Himalaya to the Kutch, or to uh, the Arabian Sea. The, the journey is almost 1600 kilometers and you are having 1200 archaeological sites all along the Saraswati. So these are important data which gives you an insight that you think twice before you say that Mahabharata is a myth. In the years 1860 to 1870, Sir Alexander Cunningham, the first Surveyor General, explored Kurukshetra and identified four cardinal points, setting out the boundaries of Kurukshetra, where four yakshas were enshrined in the past, which were the guardian deities to protect the Holy Land. The lack of inscriptions from this period can be explained by the fact that writing in India is believed to have only come into use after the arrival of Alexander in 325 BC. Rajesh Purohit again. The Ashokan inscription is not talking about the Hindu tradition, the Hindu way of life, or the epic Mahabharata. It doesn't discuss anything about us. Ashoka's time is considered to be the time of a radical reformation from Hinduism to Buddhism. Further supporting evidence comes from the discovery of coins dating from 172 BC. These were issued by the Indo-Greek ruler Ogothocles in present-day Afghanistan, which show Krishna on one side and Balarama on the other. In the 1850s, this column was discovered. It was erected by the Greek ruler Heliodorus in honour of Krishna. This has been dated to being from 113 BC. Further evidence is found in the later inscription of Pulakashini II from Badami, and this calculates the date of the Mahabharat as 3131 BC. It is, however, the oral and living traditions in India which have preserved the Mahabharat for posterity in the original Sanskrit. This oral tradition of India is echoed by these ladies from Sukhori, who are chanting the thousand names of Vishnu from the book of the Mahabharat in the original Sanskrit. Rajesh Purohit had this to say. But in India, uh, no, uh, nobody knows how and why they adapted this kind of historical tradition. But I can say this much, because of this historical tradition of Sruti and Spriti, India could preserve a history which is living in nature, 
and there is there where you do not require any kind of uh, I mean uh, evidence more than the living evidences that you have. Another example of this living tradition can be found here on the site of the battle of Kurukshetra where people come to chant the names of Krishna and remember his heroic deeds that were recorded in the Mahabharat. Legend even holds that this banyan tree was witness to the knowledge imparted by Krishna on the battlefield. Hundreds of miles away, the living tradition of India is reflected by these Hindus, who remember the Ganges River every sunset as a giver of life and a destroyer of sins, and worship it at Varanasi as part of their daily prayers, as they have done for thousands of years. In the blazing heat of the Indian summer, the yogi Shivnath performs remarkable acts of penance in honor of Krishna. Shivnath has decided to forego the pleasures of mundane life and come into the fold of sadhus. Shivnath's ancestors have done similar penances here. Traditionally, this has always been considered as the place which belonged to one of the heroes of the battle called Kara, as told in the Mahabharat. Ramprasat Birbal, who also lives here, finds many bones washed up from beneath the soil and believes that these belong to the warriors who perished in the battle. This Hindu tradition extends across the whole of Southeast Asia from Thailand, Cambodia and Laos right up to Java, Bali and Indonesia. Celebration of this living tradition of worship to Krishna is found in the most unlikely places. Here in a dance studio in Leeds, Devika Rao, a dancer, performs in honor of Krishna. S. R. Rao is India's foremost marine archaeologist. When I demolished a modern building, some temple of Vishnu of 9th century came to light below the building. This prompted me to take further deeper excavation and ultimately I came across a 15th century BC settlement. The Mahabharat document describes a beautiful city called Dwarka that was built by Krishna and is said to have been devoured by the sea. Modern day Dwarka lies off the western coast of Gujarat and even today people there celebrate the living tradition of Krishna worship. But what about Krishna's legendary city? Recently marine archaeologists from the National Institute of Oceanography discovered an entire city under the western coast of Gujarat near Beit Dwarka. Dr. Rao and his team had finally found evidence that proved the existence of Krishna's city of Dwarka that was described as being flooded by ocean waters 36 years after the Mahabharat was written. Many artifacts of considerable antiquity were found from the ocean bed. This seal shows a bull a unicorn and a goat and provide strong evidence for proof of the story from the Mahabharat which says that it served as an identity badge for the citizens. Perhaps the most significant evidence supporting Krishna's existence comes from the astronomical references found in the text of the Mahabharat. There are over 140 of these astronomical references. Dr. Nahari Archer is a professor of physics at the University of Memphis and the world's foremost researcher of the astronomical events described in the Mahabharat text. The Mahabharata war, the date of it, is an important milestone in the chronology of India. Traditionally, 
Indians have believed that the war took place about 3000 BCE. Modern scholars who have a more critical approach to the study of these epics took a different view. They did not believe the traditional view that the war took place so long ago and they wanted to determine the date by using a variety of methods, methods based on linguistics, methods based on archaeology, um, the genealogy lists in the Puranas and methods based on astronomy. And they came up with a plethora of dates ranging from about 5000 BC all the way up to 500 AD. Professor Acha uses a specially developed computer software program that enables him to view the night sky as it would have appeared at any time in the past. He has painstakingly reproduced the exact night sky for every reference to it in the Mahabharat. Professor Archer again. Turns out the types of astronomical phenomena referred to in the epic consist of mohurtas, tithis, and then eclipses, comets, and the conjunctions of planets with different stars, and so on. In the Bhishma Parva, Vyasa meets with Dhritarashtra on the eve of the war and uh, recites to him the omens that he has seen. These omens predict the imminent war between the Pandavas and the Kauravas and the terrible events which will befall both the Kuru family and the general population. The most significant of these omens is the appearance of two fiery comets. Graho Tamraruna Shikho Pradvalita Ubho People generally take the word Graha to represent a planet, but Vyasa here specifically represents Graha simply means that any object which can grasp a star, and it can be a planet, a comet, or an asteroid. Here he specifically says that it's a comet because Graho Tamraruna Shikho Prajvalitao Ubho. The two Grahas with uh, uh, blazing coppery red hair no planet has blazing coppery red hair, it's only the comets which have that. So Vyasa specifically uh, refers to graha in, in comets as graha. Then uh, I felt that uh, convinced that the verses in Bhishma Parva are really not incoherent, inconsistent, contradictory, but in fact they form a very consistent set. Professor Acha has identified further astronomical references in two of the books of the Mahabharat, namely the Udyoga and the Bhishma Pavas. Again, these were regarded as omens of imminent disaster. These were when Saturn was at Aldebaran and Mars performed a retrograde motion near Antares. Now, the astronomical events which are common to both Udyoga Parva and Bhishma Parva are these. Saturn is at Aldebaran. Mars has performed a retrograde motion at Antares. The lunar eclipse in the month of Kartika, which occurs at uh, Pleiades, is followed by a solar eclipse near Antares. So I searched for the years between 3500 BCE to about 500 CE a range of 4,000 years. In this, there are 137 such conjunctions where um, Saturn is at Aldebaran. Here we see Saturn's transit at Aldebaran. It is an event which is even today considered by Indian astrologers to be associated with great wars and violent events. The last transit of Saturn at Aldebaran was in 2001 AD, the year of ground zero. Saturn's retrogression seemingly predicting the exact month, September. Professor Acha again. And then I searched for those years in which Mars would perform a retrograde motion near Antares. Now Mars does that in about its synodic period, it's about 680 days. So I searched for a period of two and a half years on either side of each of these 137 dates. And it turns out that this reduces the set of dates from 137 to just 17. And then I look for those years where there is a lunar eclipse in uh, the month of Kartika that is near Pleiades. And this reduces the set from 17 to just 2. 
These two years identified by Professor Acha were 2183 BC and 3067 BC. I thought I could use a solar eclipse to eliminate one of those, but it turns out on both of these days, the lunar eclipse is followed by a solar eclipse which occurs in near Antares. In 2183 BCE, the winter solstice occurs in the waning phase of the moon, Krishna Panchami. And in 3067 BCE, it occurs in the waxing phase, and we want the waxing phase. So this is one way to eliminate that this 3067 BCE is the year of the war. Uh, for the 2183 BCE, to satisfy that 64 days between those two intervals, the war must have started on an Amavasya, for the new moon day. And we have definite information from the epic that the war did not start or could not have started on an Amavasya because on the 14th day of the war they break all rules of war, the war continues into night and they break the break only when the moon rises and the wee hours of early in the morning. Now if the war had started on an Amavasya, the 14th day would have been in the waxing phase and the moon would rise early in the evening and not early in the morning. Moreover, a careful study of the epic yields data about a third eclipse in October 3067 BC, which follows the solar eclipse at an interval of 13 days, just as the epic describes. The evidence presented by Professor Acha overwhelmingly pinpoints 3067 BC as the year when the great battle described in the Mahabharat took place. Detailed examinations of the astronomical references mentioned in the Mahabharat show that they were based on real astronomical events that actually took place and are not a writer's imaginary description. Because the astronomical dates and events described in the Mahabharat have been authenticated by modern scientific method, it is reasonable to conclude that the Mahabharat itself is also a factual description of events that actually took place. In acknowledging this, we are bound to recognize that Krishna, one of the Mahabharat's principal characters, must have been based on a real person. If we also take into account the archaeological evidence, and that handed down by the Indian oral and living traditions, we are led to the inevitable conclusion that Krishna did actually exist. Whilst the evidence doesn't prove that he performed miracles or had supernatural powers, does clearly authenticate that there was a real person, a man of quite extraordinary powers called Krishna. The skeptics may be doubtful, but let a believer have the last word. I am like the lotus flower, and Krishna is like the sun. And although there is such a great distance between us, I open simply due to your rays. And without you, how could I even exist?